At 4.17 p.m. on the afternoon of July 20, 1969, the hatch of the lunar module Eagle opened. Millions of people worldwide watched as astronaut Neil Armstrong descended a ladder attached to the spaceship and then became the first man ever to set foot on the surface of the moon. That occasion was punctuated by Armstrong's famous statement, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It is unlikely that any of us will ever set foot on the moon. Yet every day we take steps that may be of even greater significance. While they are typically small steps, they have in them the potential to change the trajectory of our lives, our future, and our faith. Small steps that may be, in fact, giant leaps. The first step on the moon was actually the last step of a long journey that it took to get there. The journey started about a decade before when Russia actually launched their Sputnik 1 satellite. That was on October 4th, 1957. It was about the size of a beach ball, 184 pounds with these four funky antennas hanging off it. It was 560 miles up in the air. It was orbiting the Earth every 96 minutes and traveling at a speed of about 18,000 miles per hour. But it was a big deal because it established Russia as the world leader in science and technology and engineering, and they had bragging rights. Now, the United States had a satellite in process, and they were ready to launch it the next spring. But even before they could launch that satellite, Russia sent up Sputnik 2. Sputnik 2 was not 184 pounds, it was a whopping 1,120 pounds, and it actually featured a capsule, even though it was somewhat miniature. This was now about more than bragging rights, though, because a rocket strong enough to send something this heavy into space was strong enough to send nuclear warheads anywhere on the globe. The U.S. needed to catch up. Finally, they were ready to launch their own satellite, the Explorer 1. It was attached to a Vanguard rocket. But on the test flight, this is what happened. The rocket rose about three feet, tilted to its side, and burst into flames. The international world was amused. In fact, some people called our satellite Flopnik. Or another term that was used was... Um, Sorry, uh, Kaputnik. How about that one? The Russians sent an invite to the United States offering free admission to a technical assistance class that they were offering to developing countries as an insult to the U.S. Finally, in spring of 1958, the United States was able to successfully launch a satellite. But the next step and the next win went to the Russians as well. Because three years later, on April 12, 1961, astronaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. He spent one hour and 48 minutes making a full orbit around the Earth. The U.S. had been working on their own manned flight program too, called the Mercury Program. And Freedom 7 was ready to launch, but there was hesitation. Because nobody wanted there to be an incident like there had been with the fire with the Explorer 1 and the Vanguard 1 rocket there. But on May 5th, 1961, the United States launched the first man into space, Alan Shepard, in his rocket. He took a simple 15-minute flight, went 116 miles straight up, and came straight back down. But it became... And it was a success. And it became just the next step in what would become a race to the obvious goal in space. Not just going to the moon, but actually walking on the moon. Well, I want to think about Alan Shepard, the guy in the picture here this morning, just for a minute. Because what do you think it was like for him that day when he was launched into space. Do you think there were still memories in his mind of, of watching that rocket explode into flames? 
Do you think he wondered what exactly it would be like for him? Would it go well? Would it go poorly? Would he see his family again? I'm sure there's a lot of anticipation and excitement, but I'm sure there is also some apprehension and possibly even some fear as he took a next step. And he took a first step, not just of launching a man into space, but actually putting a man on the moon. First steps. First steps typically involve risk, They involve uncertainty. They involve unfamiliarity. They involve discomfort. But you have to take first steps if you're going to get anywhere in life, in space, or in faith. And so this morning we want to talk about first steps. We actually mentioned them last week when we talk about steps of responding, how God comes to us in our faith and says, hey, here's something I want you to do. And maybe it's something he says through his word or something you hear on a Sunday morning or or maybe something that's said to you, but you're like, oh, you're right, God, I do need to do that. And we need to take that step of response and we need to take that first step. But we said last week that the first step is usually a hard step. And getting started is typically one of the most difficult things to do. In fact, we could probably test that out this morning. We won't ask you to to raise your hands. But maybe last week you were sitting here this morning, you were listening at home, and you were like, oh, and you sensed that, or you heard that God speaking to you and said, that's something in my life that I need to do something about. That's a face step that I need to take. But that was last Sunday, and seven days later, You're still sitting here, and you haven't taken that step yet. And why? It's because first steps are often the hardest steps. And so what I'd like to do this morning is to help us take that first step. Because I don't know what it is that is your faith step, but you probably need to take a first step. Maybe it's just committing to a daily quiet time where you spend time reading your Bible and praying. And just spend some time with God. Maybe that's even something you've done in the past and you need to get back to. And you're like, yeah, that's right. That's a face step I need to take. Well, what's the first step that you need to take with it? Maybe it's just something to do with your health and realizing that God gives us this temple and and we need to be good stewards of it. And so something, maybe it's it's your your diet or your exercise or, or how much sleep you're getting. And you need to take a face step. But what would be your first step? Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's something that you need to be done with, whether it's a substance or whether it's something online or whether it's that thing that you carry around in your pocket that you're constantly looking at all the time. A face step, but it needs a first step. Maybe it's leading your family in faith. Maybe it's sharing your faith with the neighbor next door. Maybe it's sharing your faith with, with a coworker. Maybe it's a relationship that's wrong that needs to end or a, a relationship that's wrong that needs to be fixed. What is your faith step and what is the first step? For most of us, it's not that we don't know what to do. For most of us, it's actually doing it and taking that first step. And sometimes, to be honest, we're confused with what that first step may be or what it may entail. But I want us to think about that this morning What is the face step that you need to take? And what is the first step that you need to take? And if you're struggling with that first step, I want to give us all, because I need this too, I want to give us some encouragement on first steps this morning. So let me ask you to turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're going to talk about a guy here who took a first step. And actually, we talked about him back last spring in February, right before this COVID thing hit. He was a prophet in Israel. His name was Elisha. And in the story that we talked about last spring, it was at the end of his life and at the end of his career, the king of Israel had come to him. And there was a story about shooting arrows out the window. And and we used it as an analogy for outreach and and the importance for all of us to engage personally and locally and globally in, in outreach. But that was at the end of the story. What we want to do is we want to go back to the beginning of the story when Elisha first becomes a prophet in Israel. And so his story shows up in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to start reading in verse number 19 as well. So it says this, so Elijah 
went from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphet. We have two different guys whose names sound a lot alike, and I'll try to keep them straight this morning. But it says Elijah went from there. Where was there? Elijah was actually at Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai. But how did he get there? Well, if you back up a couple chapters here in the book of 1 Kings, Elijah had been on Mount Carmel, and he had been engaged in this big battle, spiritual battle with the prophets of Baal. And you may remember this story where they, they built altars, and then the idea was to call down fire from God to consume the offering. And the prophets of Baal called down fire, and nothing happened, and, and actually Elijah mocked them. And then Elijah's turn came, and he said, pour all the water you want on here. And he stepped back and prayed, and fire came down from heaven and ignited that offering. And it was a huge moment in Elijah's life, and it was a huge indictment of the faithlessness and the idolatry of Israel. And it looked like it should have been a great moment, except for the fact that it ticked off the queen. And Jezebel, who was queen at that time, looked at Elijah and said, I'm taking you down, buddy. And Elijah turned and ran for his life. And he was feeling sorry for himself. He was spent. He was burnt out, worn out. And he's basically saying, God, just go ahead and take my life. And God's like, no, 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 no. And he sends an angel, and this angel goes, takes him down to Horeb there. And, and Elijah has this experience with God. And God says, no, i still got some more things for you, Elijah. And he lists three things. But one of the things that he's listed, he says, you need to go back, and you need to select or anoint the next prophet in Israel, and that would be Elisha, the son of Shaphat. And so that's what's going on in this verse. Elijah leaves where he was down there in Sinai, comes back up to Israel, and he finds Elisha. And we have no idea if he knew who Elisha was beforehand or not. I guess it doesn't really matter, but he finds him. And Elisha, as we keep reading in this verse, is out plowing in his field with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. And Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. So the tunic he was wearing, he took it off him, he put it on Elisha. And evidently, as far as what we're reading here, he turns and he walks away. We don't have any record of him saying anything. He just walks away. And so Elisha is standing there with this tunic wrapped around him. And I think it dawns on him what's actually transpiring here. And it's Elijah saying symbolically, I'm taking the role of prophet off of me and I'm putting it onto you if you choose to accept it. And so Elijah walks away and Elisha has a decision to make. And I don't think it's like a real obvious decision either. Because if I'm looking at Elijah and I'm like, do I want this guy's job? Do I really want to take on 400 prophets next time this comes up? Do I really want to be the one who's running for his life because the, the queen's after me? Do I really want to be the one that, that everybody doesn't like because he says things that, that makes him mad? Because he's speaking for God. And I wonder if Elisha stands there and says, like, do I really want that job? And Do I really want to give up what I have? But as Elijah walks away, it tells us this in verse number 20. Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. And he takes first steps. And he takes physical steps in following Elijah. But he takes first steps too spiritually in determining the rest of his life in what direction he's going to go. And so he catches up with Elijah and he says this. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? And all Elijah is saying here is, go ahead, go back. I'm not preventing you. If you need to say goodbye, go ahead and say goodbye. And so Elisha went, left him, Elijah, and went back. And then he took his yoke of oxen and he slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and he became his servant. And he takes a small step that becomes a giant leap. He goes from an unknown farmer, other than he's known to God, and just like last week, God always knows who we are and where we are. He goes from an unknown farmer to becoming the great prophet in Israel, and actually, in a lot of ways, maybe even a greater prophet than Elijah had been. 
He started over here and he got over here. How did he do it? He took small steps. They became giant leaps. But those small steps started with one step, and that would be a faith step. So what I want to do is go back into these verses. And it was just three verses. It seemed like a pretty simple story. But there's some truths in here that I think can help us when we are facing faith steps in our story. What do we need to do to take the first step? So here's the first thing. The first strategy to look at. First of all, we need to consider the cost. And cost is not exactly the same thing as risk. We're not talking about here considering the risk, because anytime we follow God, there's always going to be risk. But there's also going to be cost. And anytime we take a step, there's going to be cost. I think we talked about this last week. In choosing the United States and choosing to go to the moon, there was tremendous cost literally involved. Where the, the 1961, the budget for, for NASA's um, Apollo program was $1 million. By the time we got to the moon, it, we were spending $1 million every three hours on the Apollo program. That's a lot of cost. But when we talk about first step, there is going to be cost as well. And it's going to be cost to us maybe in the areas of discomfort. Maybe it's going to be in the areas of loss. When you look at Elisha here, he was evidently a man of means. And it's a little difficult, and you can read different translations to see how difficult it is to translate that 12 yoke of oxen. But it's very possible that he owned these 12 yoke. He would have owned 24 oxen of his own. That's a man of some wealth. And to have that much, or to have that many oxen, he had some fields there too. And to, to, do, and to, and to follow Elijah, he had to give up that. And so there was a cost involved in that. There's going to be a cost family-wise. He wanted to say, go back and say goodbye to mom and dad, but he must have had a good relationship with mom and dad. He probably grew up on the family homestead there, but he was saying goodbye to all those things. That was cost as well. He was leaving behind what was familiar and comfortable and choosing the discomfort. But any time that we're going to take first steps, it's going to cost us. And we just need to know that. But if we will keep going, the cost becomes worth it. But I want to just remind us of this too. When we don't take steps, that costs us as well. There's always a cost involved in the transaction. And the cost is whether I'm going to spend it here or whether I'm going to spend it here. I think about this with, with Alan Shepard. The cost could have been his life. At the same time, the cost could have been, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. And somebody else could have been the first man, and he would have spent the rest of his life going, that could have been me. And when we don't take steps of faith, we miss out on opportunities that God has for us. And so there's a cost in not responding as well. And so I think it's helpful to us to realize that there's a cost, but to realize that if we don't do something, there's a cost too. So that's not to, meant to prevent you from taking a first step. It's just to make you aware so that you don't get blindsided. But to remind you of this, to remind me of this, that the cost to move forward is generally less than the cost to stay put. And so that's the first strategy this morning here, is to simply consider the cost. Secondly, run, don't just walk. He ran after Elijah. I love that. As Elijah walks away and he stands there and thinks about, should I, should I, whatever, he just turns around and runs. And I love the enthusiasm that he presents in that situation. And if we're looking at taking a first step, one of our problems is sometimes we're like, yeah, I probably should do that. I don't know if I really want to. Yeah, I might mess that up. You know, I've tried that before. It didn't go so well. Oh, well, I guess I'll go ahead. And we start with hesitation and we start with reluctance and then we fail. No surprise, right? If we're going to be successful, sometimes we need to say, you know what? This is worth going after. This is a step that I need to take. And sure, it's going to cost me. I don't care. I'm going to run after that. I'm going to show enthusiasm. If you're not convinced, you're never going to be committed. And we need to commit ourselves to that. And what enthusiasm does is it helps us to stay focused on the possibilities. 
And what reluctance does is it keeps us looking at the obstacles and all the problems that could come and all the reasons why this won't work. And partly we need enthusiasm to just to break us free of gravity and our inertia. Do you know how many pounds of thrust it takes to lift a rocket? Even if you're not a scientist, it's not that hard to figure out. It just takes one more pound of thrust than the weight of the rocket. But you know how hard that is? And one of the great engineering challenges of rockets is you need fuel to ignite the rockets and to give you the thrust, except every time you add fuel, you add weight. And so you're constantly fighting yourself, and you have to find that right balance. But we need enthusiasm sometimes to get us off the launch pad and to get us going. And if you can get excited about it, that's the best thing that you can do. So I think when we don't have enthusiasm, what we often do is like, yeah, I should. Maybe I will. Eh, today's not a good day. Uh, I'll get started on it tomorrow. Oh, I should make that phone call, but eh, I'm not just really feeling up to it. And you know what we do? We just keep procrastinating, and we keep procrastinating, and keep procrastinating, and the rocket sits on the launch pad, and nobody ever fires it. And so if we're going to take first steps, we need to run and not walk. Number three, we need to say our goodbyes. He went back to say goodbye, and there's nothing wrong with saying goodbye. In fact, Elijah, I don't know that he encouraged it, but he certainly wasn't discouraging it at this moment. He said, yeah, go ahead. Go back and say goodbye to mom. Because here's the deal. When we talk about starting something, we also talk about ending something. And sometimes it would be helpful to us to realize as we're taking faith steps to say, you know what, in taking this step, I am ending this here. And sometimes that's ending a bad thing that we need to put in our past, but sometimes that's ending a good thing too. But that's how life works. We move from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. You know, many of us have, have been through that experience where you drop your kids off at college and you watch them walk away and you go back and get in your car and you're like, wow, could it, could it be over already? And I remember that with each of my kids. But you know, there was this sense when I saw them walk away, it's like, okay, this hurts me, but this is good. Because this is the next stage of life for them. And, you know, was it hard to go back home? Sure. But you could focus on this idea of, like, what's going on in their life. But we need to do the same thing in our story sometimes. Say, you know what? I may need to say goodbye here so that I can say hello to something else here. And endings are usually a necessary part of beginnings. And sometimes where we've been, well, it's been great. If we just stop there, we never get to where we can go. If we just send a man into orbit and he comes back down and we say, look what we've done, we never get a man to the moon. And it's the same thing here. If Elijah, if Elisha doesn't say goodbye, he doesn't get to experience all these things. Now, taking that first step and saying goodbye to an old path is difficult but it's still worthwhile. The fourth thing here, burn the plow, butcher the oxen, seal off the exits, don't give yourself an exit. Probably the most famous story that we know of this is back in 1519, uh, Cortez went, came to America, down in South America there, and, and wanted to conquer the Aztec uh, nation. He had 600 men with him. They offloaded onto the shore, and he said what? Burn the boats. You're never going home, guys. It's the same idea here. He burned the oxen. He, he burned the plow to say, you know what? I'm done. And we need to do the same thing, too. We need to remove the excuses. We need to remove the temptations. We need to remove whatever it is that might suck us back where we were and keep us from taking that step. Maybe we need to cut up the credit cards or unplug the TV or, or purge the fridge or delete the app or whatever it is. So we get to the place where we don't have an option to go back. But to say, you know what, I am going forward. I am taking this step. Here we go. There's no other option now because I can't go back to where I was. Number five, temper your expectations. Elijah left this 
somewhat lucrative career that he had. Twelve yoke of oxen, all these fields. It looked like things were going well for him. He left all of that to become what? A prophet? Well, that's not what it says if you look at verse number 21. He left all of that to become a servant. And sometimes I think we have this mindset, okay, I've struggled with this decision and I'm going to make and I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to do what you want me to do in this situation. And we take that step and we expect everything in our world to change immediately. And it doesn't change. Except one thing did. In taking that step, you changed. Now, you may have a thousand more steps to take, but it still has significance. But realize that you may have a thousand more steps to take before you become the prophet. And so I would just say that to all of us, temper your expectations. When you step out there in faith, sometimes it's like, yes, I'm waiting for it, you know, every, all the fireworks to go off. And nothing happens. That's okay. That's how it works. Because one step leads to the next step, which leads to the next step. Be patient about your pro- progress. You know, we live in a world that's very result-oriented. We live in a world that's very now-oriented. And we live in a world where we want to take this step and have it all happen immediately. That's not how God builds faith. And God doesn't actually build our faith by rewarding our faith with, with big prizes behind door number three. God rewards our faith when we take a step by giving us more faith to take the next step. And that's not exciting or glamorous but it's effective. And so Elisha takes that step and, and hmm, guess I'm just a servant. And he takes another step and doesn't change that much. And he takes another step. And he, but eventually he gets to the place where God says, now, now you're ready. And so have reasonable expectations in realizing that the outcome of your decision doesn't determine whether or not your decision was right. Decisions are right because they're right, not because of how they turn out. Sixth thing here, buddy up. Elisha needed Elijah. I think he probably needed to be trained as a prophet. He definitely needed to know that there's power that comes from having a partner. In fact, I wonder if Elijah would have been as depressed and defeated and as worn out and burnt out as he was if Elisha had been there with him on Carmel. We'll never know. But as we make changes in our stories and as we take these steps of faith, sometimes we need somebody there. In fact, I would say all the time, we need somebody there to help us with that step. Because there's a power that comes from having somebody beside you. As preparing for this series, and we're obviously using space as a backdrop, I've been reading some books, and one of the books I've been reading is called Spaceman. It's written by a guy by the name of Mike Massimino, who uh, uh, was one of the... uh, um, Space shuttle astronauts. But he's talking about, and it's just a story of his life, and he went to MIT, and he's working on a PhD at MIT. And he goes in, and and after your first year, you have to, you know, you've kind of said, this is the direction I'm going, where my thesis is going to be. But you have to be able to go in there and defend it enough that they allow you to continue on in the program. And he said, I studied, and I studied, and I studied, and I went in there and sat in front of all these profs, and they started asking me questions. He said, it was awful. He said, I didn't know anything. He said, I panicked. He said, I bombed out completely. And with bombing out, I knew that my dreams of an astronaut, being an astronaut someday were over. Well, he was given permission to take the test again, or if you want to, this exam, this oral exam again. And he wasn't quite sure if he could do it or not, or if he should just abort the whole thing and just go do something else with his life. And another guy walked in who had been through the same process the year before and said, hey, how'd your test go? Horrible. He said, well, how'd you study? He said, I just crammed every night as much as I could. He said, well, who'd you study with? Well, no one. He said, well, that's your problem. He said, here, let me help you. And he went and he got three other guys from MIT who had all been through this process. And night after night after night, those guys would gather around the table and fire questions at Mike Massimino. He retook that test and he passed it just fine. But he said, I learned a lesson. You never do anything alone when you're an astronaut. We need to learn that lesson, too. When it comes to this faith thing, God does not intend for us to do it alone. And when you're taking faith steps, and especially when they're scary and when they're dangerous and maybe they're they're imposing, get somebody else 
to do it with you. Number seven here, don't judge the journey by the first step. And this fits with number five, which we already mentioned here. But there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be times when you take that step of faith and it doesn't go the way that you think it will. Keep on going. There are going to be times when the rocket blows up on the launch pad. Keep on going. And unfortunately, that fire on our first uh, Explorer one there, uh, the Vanguard one, was not the only one time we had a problem in our space program. But you keep on going. And that means even if you fail, you keep on going. Even if you get discouraged, you keep on going. Even if it's not what you expected, you keep on going. Don't judge the journey by the first step. And then finally, deploy your dependence on God. Deploy your dependence on God. If you jump ahead in the story to 2 Kings chapter 2, and if you can get there quickly, I encourage you to go there with me. 2 Kings chapter 2. We go to a second story here in Elisha's life. The first story is when he's called to become this prophet. He takes the step to follow Elijah. But up until now, he's been Elijah's servant. Everything's about to change in 2 Kings 2 because Elijah gets taken up into heaven and Elisha is left standing there by himself and now it's his turn. And this is the story of what happens next. 2 Kings 2 verse number 12. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took a hold of his garment and tore it in two. He watched Elijah being taken into heaven in this fiery chariot. And then in verse number 13, Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, probably that same one that had been wrapped around his shoulders to start with. He picked up that cloak that had fallen from Elijah, and he went back and he stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah, and he struck the water with it. And he said this, Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. And he's to this point in his life, he said, okay, God, I'm in. I've taken these steps up till now, but now I need you desperately. If you're not in this, it ain't going to happen. So please show me that you're in this. And he thrust the coat at the water and the Jordan splits. And what was God saying? I got you. I got you. Go ahead. I got you. And maybe you're at that point in your story where it's like, I need to take that face step, but I'm afraid. I need to take that face step, but I'm afraid of, I, I might fail or, or, or someone might give you a hard time or that might put me in a, in a bad situation down the road here or, or family members wouldn't understand. I'm afraid or whatever. What we need to do is say, okay, God, I'm in trouble if you don't show up. This whole prophet thing's not going to work if it's just me. But if you want me to do this and if I'm going to be obedient to you, I'm going to just put my full dependence on you and see what you do. And maybe that's where you are this morning to say simply, God, I cannot do this on my own. So what is the faith step that you need to take? Whatever that faith step is, it's going to require a first step. And here's what I know about first steps. They are often difficult. But we can look at this story here of Elisha, and we can see different things that he did in his story that helped him take that first step that became ultimately a giant leap. So I don't know what that step is, and I mentioned some things at the beginning, and, and, and maybe there's something else that God's doing in your mind. And, and remember, we're not talking about specific steps as many as just types of steps, and these are starting steps. But maybe your step is sharing your faith, or, or maybe it's praying with your wife, or maybe it's asking somebody to mentor you, or maybe it's joining a small group. I don't know what it is, but whatever your first step is, I know it's a hard step. But what can you do to make it a successful step? First steps are small steps, but enough small steps lead to giant leaps. They interviewed Louise Shepard, who evidently was at home when that rocket went off, and they found her in her yard, and they asked her about uh, her husband, Alan, going into space, and this is what she said. This is just a baby step, I guess, compared to what we're going to say. 
Think about that. It may just be a baby step compared to what God wants to do in your story. It might be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Will you take that first step of faith? And then the next, and then the next, and then the next. Because that's how faith grows. And that's how small steps become giant leaps. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for just the people that, and the stories that we get to read because they're just like us. And they have fears like we do and they struggle with procrastination like we do. And they make decisions that sometimes they go back on and like we do or they get discouraged like we do. But I thank you for these people that encourage us on our way. And we thank you for the person of Elisha who took that hard step and as an example to us, I pray that you would encourage us with his life. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Where do you sit? What is the faith step that God's asking you to take? And maybe you identified that last week even, but you haven't taken any steps yet. What's the faith step? But then what's the first step that you need to take? Maybe it's buddying it up. Maybe it's, it's just expressing your dependence on God. Maybe it's changing your expectations. I don't know. But what is the first step that you need to take. Will you take it? Maybe your faith step is to actually put your faith and trust in God and through Jesus Christ. What he did when he died on the cross rose again so that our sins could be defeated, so we could find forgiveness, so that we could live forever with God, have a relationship with him. Maybe your first step is to simply pray that prayer, realizing that it's going to change life but realizing it will be worth it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use Elisha's story. Pray that you would use your word and your spirit and encourage us this week to take first steps. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.